242. Welcome back, YouTube, to Acts 2 and 42. My name is Keith. If this is your first time uh, joining us, this is a Christian live stream uh, focused and dedicated to uh, connecting, building, fellowshipping around the core principles found in Acts the second chapter, the 42nd verse. Today, to those that are regular, uh, regular in the chats, regular in the live streams, uh, I want to say thank you for, for stopping in. Um, but I do want to apologize that this is uh, pre recorded. Um, the Rebel G and I will be in the comments to chat back and forth with you. But uh, at this time, I suspect that I'm on a camping trip with some of the kids. I uh, wanted to pre-record this so this could go out, but also because of the, to the topic it is, I wanted to take the, take some time to lay out, start to finish, you know, kind of what I see without kind of getting thrown off by every single comment. You guys know in the live streams, if you guys comment, I put it up, we share it, we talk about it. And it's always good. It's always insightful. But with this, I just kind of wanted to lay it out, start to finish best I could. Um, please chat though, because it won't interrupt. Obviously, I'm pre-recording this. Um, Chat and comment both with me uh, and also with others if you have things to say, whether it's amen or whether it's I don't see it that way. Doesn't matter. Um, I am always genuinely interested in your thoughts, um, but also the chat could be used like taking notes. Now, I was going to say I'm going to going to start from what I see. Let's let's start from here and let's move move through it. Um, get a pen and a pad or the chat and just make notations at certain parts. If you have to let me know what time you're asking this question so I can reference it. Um, or just say in regards to this, what do you think about that? Or in regards to this, my comment is that, um, just so people after the fact can keep up with the comments and, you know, uh, there's no disconnect between the statement and what you were referring to. Um, but like I say, we're going to try to be in the chats. Um, I may be able to step away real quick and, jump in and chat with you and and hopefully uh the rebel g uh will be holding it down in the chats uh as well um before we jump in i do want to say that it's it's we're going on summertime and i'm definitely uh considering and or made the decision to uh change the day uh the day in which we do the live stream you know summertime saturdays people got things to do um so i think it's either going to be tuesday or wednesday best i can call it right now um, definitely hit us in the chat Tuesday, Wednesday, sound good to you around the same time, um, like from 12 to one or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah. And I think that'd be a little bit easier and that way we catch you guys live, not necessarily, you know, you guys are out at some event out in the community or a soccer game or whatever it is. I know everyone's got things to do. And especially during the summertime is when we're enjoying the outdoors out with family. And that's awesome. So let's do it. Push it to the weekday. Um, you get a lunchtime break or whatever, and maybe jump on the chat. Um, yeah, but if, if you, if you think, uh, another time is better, I'm cool with that too, but that's what I'm thinking right now. So reason why this came up, right? This was all inspired from a recent conversation at a Bible study. And, you know, a lot of people can have this, you know, curiosity or, or, or looking for understanding to, to really pin down, you know, wait a minute, uh, are we, do we confess with our mouth? You know, is it, is it the sinner's prayer? Is it just by confession that we're saved? Is it just by faith, just by believing? Is it, you know, water baptism? Is it, you know, spirit baptism, you know, cause this sounds like this and this sounds like that. And if you look over here, this sounds like this contradicts that I want to make my case to how I see it start to finish. Um, I've got some notes here. Hopefully it keeps me on track. But one thing I want to say is these are all the same guys talking. Same group of guys. Same faith. So these aren't different people with different opinions and different theories all over the place. You know, Acts of 15 chapters is a great place. And when, when there was doubt, they went to the elders in Jerusalem. They asked, hey, guys, what is it that you're telling these people? Because they're saying this. Do you guys say that? I don't say that. And they're like, no, 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 we don't say that. We don't do that, right? Which is what we should be doing, you know? Um, but this is what they did. So they they were, there was uniformity. They were all on one accord. Um, the same guy that says this over here, right, is the same guy that said that over there. Same group of guys, same doctrine, same faith. So we need to reconcile all these statements together. And, 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 uh, what I want to do is I want to start from Romans 10 popular scripture where they get, you know, the sinner's prayer, confessing with your mouth, uh, for salvation. Um, 
I want to lay out for you what I see. My sight, my knowledge, my understanding is limited. You may have something that I don't, but I want to show, I want to lay out what I see in context of the scripture that there, and I want to try to zipper that together um, with the other passages in scripture, right? Uh, it's like puzzle pieces, you know, and I use this about the Bible all the time, but it's like puzzle pieces and we got to put them together to get a clear, vivid picture of everything that was done. So now this is obviously according to the apostles. We have Paul in Romans, the 10th chapter. But Peter says something similar, and Paul and Peter taught and did the same thing. So that's awesome. So they're saying the same thing, and they did the same thing. So the only thing I'll ask as we jump in is I'll say that I am 100% genuine. Okay? I'm 100%, 100% genuine and sincere. I have no interest in dunking on anyone. I have no interest in debating anyone. I have no interest in in saying someone's not saved because they did it X way or, or Y way. Um, all I'm doing is genuinely, genuinely looking to the scriptures and saying, this is what I see as best I can call it. So the only thing I'll ask is that please listen and, and be genuine in listening and consider these passages in light of that. You know, if you, if you originally think something different, if you can suspend that judgment, put it on pause, you know, and just say, I wonder if this could be, or whatever the case may be, just allow yourself to go down that road. Sincerely, you know, truly, um, it is very possible that I'm wrong in all of this or in a point of this. It's very, very possible. I think I was wrong once or twice. Um, I think that's what I've been told. So it's possible. Um, but it's also very possible that I'm right about a few things. So let's put that out there. Um, but you'll never know the difference if you're not genuine. You'll never know what's true or false. You'll never know where I'm right and you're wrong or where you're wrong and I'm right or that was the same thing, right? Where I'm wrong and you're right if we're not genuine, intellectually genuine in having the conversation. So um, you got to be willing to open up your mind and consider and challenge your 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 uh, presuppositions, your your the thoughts you have, you know, coming to the table, right? So lastly, I'll say, and then we'll jump right into the verses, that there are rules and then there are exception to the rules. Okay. So there's like the general way. Um, and then there's like one time or one thing that's outside of what happens in general. So it can be 99% of the time the sun comes up. 1% of the time something else happens. I'm just giving you a very, very, you know, loose general generality. So I don't want to, you know, I want to deter you and others from getting tangled up in what about isms. Um, case in point, what about the thief on the cross? Right. So God said to Moses, I'll have mercy upon whom I'll have mercy. And ultimately, he is Lord. It's up to him. Who saved? Who's not saved? Who was genuine? Who really believed when they confessed? Did they really believe? And did the baptism matter? And did they receive the spirit? And all this, right? We're going by the rule, meaning what was generally taught that all men should do to follow Christ, to be saved, right? So there are exceptions. There are the anomalies, but don't get caught in the whataboutisms. I don't, um, that's fine, you know. Uh, so anyway, let's jump in. Let's jump in, right? Um, let's see. Let me, let me throw up the throw up the, the chapter we have right now. Um, little tiny housekeeping, get the scripture up on the screen. So, um, oh, didn't mean to do that. Just meant to slide her over. So Romans 10, key scripture, right? So you got to start at the beginning. It's, it's the, the 14th, uh, the ninth chapter down to the 12th chapter and 14, 15 chapter, where we find the meat of it. But at the beginning, you know, we actually see the context and you can back up a couple chapters to see what had Paul been speaking to them about to get further context um, of his overall uh, message to the church. But this is to the, the Roman church, the church in Rome, and a letter he's writing. And he says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, right? For I bear them record. Like basically all I want in my heart is for Israel to be saved. I can testify to the fact they have a zeal of God, like, like they desire these things and, and there's, there's, there's a true desire there, right? But not according to knowledge. Like, so the desires are the hearts there, but they don't understand. They don't have the knowledge that they need. Um, and it wasn't, you know, Christ consciousness or anything, you know, Gnostic 
as far as knowledge. Um, it was just knowing that he's the savior, knowing that this was the Messiah that was prophesied. You were told something else, but this is him. So uh, let's jump down. Um, that if you if if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So we can we can clip that out. You know, we can make posters out of it. We can we can make uh, social media posts about it. Uh, we can use it as our core doctrine and, and just pin it up in church and just say, just confess with your mouth and we're done there, right? Uh, because ultimately, and again, I'm not dunking, um, but this is unfortunately what's done. We read that and that's pretty much it, not really putting it into the, the general context of what they taught as far as salvation, as far as, uh, anyway, all this goes. So, but to the Jews, and this isn't just to the Jews, I'm not saying that, but he's literally speaking about the Jews right now. What was the, the common problem that he's speaking of with the Jews was that they did not have knowledge that this was the true son of God, that this was the true Messiah come to save them. So if you can confess with your mouth, right, that this is the Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. Like what he's talking about is if you can actually believe the story. We, just, we need to get you to believe. So it talks about, you know, what the, what belief happens in the heart, right? But down to the 12th verse. Now, this is why I say it's not just to the Jew. We get context. The reason why it's important to find out it was to the Jews was because they didn't believe in him. But it's not just to the Jews because there's no difference between Jew and Greek, right? Galatians the third chapter says the same thing. There's no difference. There's no different plan of salvation for the Jew and for the Gentile, right? So it's the same Lord over all, and he's rich upon all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, man, clip that out, put it up on a plaque. That's the, that's the doctrine of salvation. Just call upon him, right? So if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved, Paul says. Peter says the same thing, but we're going to get that in a second. Here's why he's saying that, the 14th verse down. This is the process of being informed about something. <laughs> right? How can you call upon him? How can, how can he be your savior? I'm going to add one thing before that is how can he be your savior? If you didn't call on him, how can you call on him? If you can't, if you haven't believed in him, how can you believe in him? If you've never heard about him? Well, how can you hear about him? Except someone preach and how can someone preach except they be sent? Right? Um, now, here's the thing, though. Paul says, as far as Israel goes, he did call out to them. They do know. <laughs> they don't care. And then this is this is his uh um this is what he ultimately determines is their problem, right? Yes, they have to know, they have to hear it, they have to believe. But then after that. Whether they choose to believe it or not is another issue. And he's saying, he's called out to them, right? I say to you, they ha have they not heard? They have. Yes, verily. Truly they have. The sound went out into the earth, to the ends of the world, right? Moses, you know, I'll provoke you to jealousy with people. And this is talking about the Gentiles. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the Gentiles. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise them up. They're going to believe in me to provoke you to jealousy to bring you back. Because why? All day long, I stretched forth my hand into a disobedient and gainsaying people. The people in general, not every single Israelite or Jew, is has been disobedient. But the people in general, um, the entire Bible is filled of warnings and asking them to come back and them constantly walking away, constantly disobeying, constantly going after other gods, right? So anyway... Paul and Peter both said the same thing. They said what? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts the second chapter. Yeah, so we got the we got Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falling on Pentecost. If you're not familiar with that, read that first. Um and then some of them thought that these people were drunk because of how they were acting. And he's like, no, they're not drunk. This is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Is it Joel or Joel? I've heard it both ways. I, I really don't. Like, half the time I try to say things properly, but it, it really, it, most of these are Hebrew words. 
um, names, like Joel was a Hebrew name or or whatever that was at that time, uh, some version of Hebrew. And I doubt I'm going to be able to say it the way they say, say it. So I might as well just say Joel, you know, uh, Americanize it, you know, and and whatever with my accent. But and he says, so this is what was spoken spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, right? This is a prophecy of the last days of God pouring out his spirit. People, you know, sons and daughters prophesying, seeing visions and dreams, right? Uh, and then he says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord. And right there, like, all these don't coincide with like the moment the spirit fell, sons and daughters prophesy. This is a series of events unfolding, which, which, either signal or lead up to the, the great day of the Lord. So a lot of times we read those prophecies and this has nothing to do with this doctrine, but a lot of times we read those prophecies and we're looking for all that to happen in the same period, all that to happen at the same moment, same day or whatever. But these are, these are a lot of, a lot of time in between these events. So these are loose prophecies that signal the leading up to the culmination of that day. My take. Uh, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it, when that day, right, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter says, right, the day that Joel prophesied, this is unfolding right now. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words. So again, I mean, because the gospel is first to Israel. I don't want you to think like this is Hebrew Israelite or or whatever uh, Jew centric, Israel centric doctrine. But the message was to his natural born children first. That's all. They were given a chance to eat at the supper. If they didn't eat, he invited others. Hopefully that will provoke them to want to come eat too, right? Not miss out. So you men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, a man approved of God. So he starts preaching the gospel to them. Okay, just wanted to arrange some stuff. He starts preaching the gospel to them. He talks about how he was crucified and slain. God raised him from the dead. Um, goes on and talks about David's basically prophecy, right? Stop and read that if you don't. If you're not familiar with Joel, go read Joel. Um, but just moving along, because we got a lot to get through. But um, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. So he's saying, this is the son of God. This is the Messiah. This is him. Just know that. Okay. Without a shadow of a doubt from David on, he fulfilled this. Right. And these are the adventures saying unfolding, pay attention. Like these are, these are the things that, that, that the prophets prophesied would happen before the Lord come. And then this is what David said about the Lord. This is him. Now, when they heard this, Oh, belief happens in the heart, right? Remember Romans 10. Belief happens in the heart. Someone was sent. Someone preached it. Someone heard it. And they believed in their heart. Well, what will they have to do ne next? Well, he said, well, if, if you can con call on the name, right? Confess with your mouth or call on him, right? That you believe. So look, I'm sorry. Peter didn't say. And Peter said, oh, they're pricked in their heart. They said to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, oh, say the center, sinner's prayer. And I'm not dunking. I'm not, I'm not really, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not dunking on nobody. But he didn't say, just confess, just call upon him. Say the sinner's prayer, recite these words. What shall we do? Then Peter said, repent. Have you repented? Do you see the error of, the, error of your ways? Do you realize why you need a savior? Or do you think you're healthy and you're well and do not need a physician? If you remember that that reference. Do you know you need a savior? Do you know you're not righteous by your deeds alone? Okay. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's a lot there. And we're going to, as we go through other scriptures, I think we're going to reference back. So remember this, you know, not key scripture, but remember this because there's a lot in there. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them, added unto them, added unto them <laughs> about three thousand. Don't laugh. Um, 
Acts 2 of 42. What'd they do next, guys? What'd they do next? They, they repented. They were baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. They received the Holy Spirit. What next? They continued steadfastly, unmovable, in the teaching of the apostles and in fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayer. Big salute. Hashtag salute in the comments to Acts, the second chapter, the 42nd verse. Um, now, you now if you didn't know, if you really didn't get it, you know, I think those things are core and I think they're, they're really valuable. And that's why I always chose that to highlight. That's all I'm trying to do, you know. So the heart, we got the heart. We have repentance, right? Water baptism through repentance. This was to accomplish the remission of sins. And at some point they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we have, we do have water right? Water baptism and spirit outside of faith. Can't see my hands <laughs> outside of faith, outside of, um, yeah, believing in the heart, hearing the gospel, believing in the heart, all those things have to take, take place. And you got to call on him. You know what I mean? You're calling on him through the act of saying, in this case, what, do, what, what can I do to be saved? What can I do? And by repenting and being baptized in his name, you're calling upon him in a sense. Uh, so I think all that fulfills what he said earlier in this chapter about whoever, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. It's not yelling it out loud, right? So well, we got water and spirit. So I want to, I want to, uh, to definitely highlight that. So next I'd like to say, so this is, you know, we got Romans 10 where Paul said it, right? How he said it, what he said need to be done for them to be saved. And we got Acts the second chapter, which um, had already taken place, you know, before Paul wrote those letters. Um, this is the same thing Peter said in the same, and we see that when the process unfolds, when the rubber hits the road, what they actually do, right? So that's, that's the first example of the, the same doctrine being taught, but then when the rubber hits the road, what do they do? So the second one I'll give is Acts the 16th chapter. You know, if you want to know how these things were done, let's look at, look in the scriptures at how they actually did them in those events, not just passages where they reference being saved or they reference something. Um, but let's just see what they prescribed and uh, how they actually, you know, performed it. Right. So Acts, the second chapter. Uh, yep. Scroll down. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just want to make sure I didn't miss anything that I have to point out. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all the context in the beginning. If if you feel like it's relevant, definitely stop and read that. Um, 14th chapter, the apostles, uh, when, the, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there, right? As soon as they arrived, they pray for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon an, any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? So they're, they're getting the message that, that people have believed the gospel and turned to Jesus Christ, right? They believe in him. Well, they, we're going to pray, you know, we're going to go in and we're going to pray that they receive the spirit because they've only been baptized. So notice a, they didn't only had confessed and it wasn't, well, they confessed. So they're saved. They said the sinner's prayer. They believe, they believe, you know, it's through faith that we're saved. Ephesians is the second chapter, right? So. They didn't say any of these things. They said, well, we, we're glad they believe. We know they've been baptized in water in the name of Jesus. So no, no, it's not John's baptism. It's not nothing like that. It's just they've been, all that's good, right? But they haven't received the spirit yet. So they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So again, they already had the water. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning they were submerged in water, proclaiming faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was... The same baptism of John, and we'll get into that, but it was, it wasn't, yeah, I guess we'll get into that, right? Um, they were baptized in Jesus' name, submerged in water. That's what the word baptized means is, is submerged, um, submerged, right? Uh, in water, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and they received the Spirit after prayer, right? So we got water and Spirit again. Second account. Third account. The Gentiles, 
And again, if you don't, if you're not familiar with the story of Cornelius, the, the first Gentile believer, start at the beginning of Acts the 10th chapter, and also with Peter's vision um, that he had of receiving the Gentiles. Uh, so both with Paul's conversion and with this, you know, God did the work. He he notified all parties, you know, he notified uh, Ananias, I think it was, um, that he was going to be sending Paul. And he would have, he would had to have prompted him to believe in that because Paul was killing guys. He was, he was for killing people that were preaching the gospel. So, and in this case, you know, Peter probably would have never accepted Cornelius or Gentile, except God had already shown him that he was, he was needing to, to accept them, you know, uh, that he accepted them. So the Gentiles hear the good news, right? So I, I believe it's all preached up here, right? He explains to him and he preached uh, the gospel, right? And Peter, Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. It's not just Jews. It's not Jew or Greek, right? Not Jew or Gentile. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and, and does what's right. Speaking of Cornelius' example, this is the message of the good news for the people of Israel. That there is peace with God through Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So we're not, there's no, uh, Paul talked about the, the, the uh, wall of partition between the Jew and the Gentile. The, the, the righteousness according to the law and the people of the law and the people of, of Yahweh, you know, the people of the book. And there was a wall separating them from the other nations that didn't follow that. There were savages or heathens or idolaters and... Um, but Christ is able to reconcile, make peace and unity because he's Lord of all, right? You know what happened through Judea, beginning in Galilee, Galilee, and John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And then Jesus went around doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And when, and we apostles are witnesses of all that he did through, throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, and he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be judge of all the living and the dead. He is the one that the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. So again, like the prophet Joel being Joel being mentioned, he mentions here, this is what was prophesied. He is the one. As Peter was saying this, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. So why, why were they amazed? So they had already witnessed this. The Pentecost spirit pouring out, you know, speaking in tongues, magnifying God, uh, understanding each other in languages we they never heard before. They already, they already saw all of this and like, they have to be like, Oh, like, well, like this is happening again. Like this is, this is him. He's doing it, but he's doing it to them. And one thing, you know, I give a shout out every once in a while to the, to the chosen series for things that I think that it, it highlights very well. But one thing I think it highlights is the, um, the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles. And it wasn't good. And yeah, on both sides, I believe, you know, but yeah, that he poured out on them. He he poured out his spirit. He put his spirit in unclean vessels. You know, they're dogs, they're, they're unclean, they're, you know, savages, but it's just like, man, they, they have to be amazed. And this proves that God is receiving them. This proves Peter's vision, but it, and it shows them in real life that God is with these people. God is moving. His spirit is moving through these people, no matter what I think about them, or no matter what my religion taught me previously, God's doing something here, right? So Peter's very next question, they have been, they've received the baptism of fire, right? As we call it, right? The, the, the Holy Spirit being poured out. But then Peter says, hold on, can anyone object to being baptized? Can any man forbid water? Now that they've received the Holy Spirit. So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
So again, spirit came first, but can you forbid the water? You've not been washed. <laughs> so you have to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name. So again, water and spirit. Um, you know what I don't have? I have to get this real quick. There's another one. I thought I, I guess I changed. Uh, I'm thinking out loud. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, what I wanted to get was another scripture in Acts. You guys might know where I'm going next. If you do, put in the chat where you think I'm going next. A little too late. John's disciples. It doesn't matter what version. Um, if you see me flip flop from versions, I, there's, there's no strategy to that. There's no reason for it. You know, um, honestly, for this purpose of just talking about what it is and what it means, I don't care, you know, at all. Um, so sometimes I'll get the King James cause I'm familiar with the language in that, but sometimes I'll get the, the NLT or something else or BSP because it says it in, in more simple language. You, if you've been here before, you know, I do that, but I'm just explaining. Um, when it came to pass that while, well, let, let me get another, uh, let me get to see here. This is, I've already looked at the, yep. See, I already had these while Apollos was in Corinth. Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? Have you been baptized with fire, right? No, we haven't heard that there is a Holy Spirit, right? So what did he ask next? Well, what baptism did you experience? How were you baptized? They said of John, right? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong at all, because what was John? John was the uh, the the forerunner. You know, he was the precursor. He he established the way um, and prepared those to be ready for the Lord when he came. So they just got the first step. They got phase one of all this. They didn't know that we were in phase two already. They didn't know the one that John preached had come already. So they just been baptized by John with water, right? And we can we can get to that, but um. So John's baptism called for repentance of sin. But John himself told the people to believe in one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So one thing I think that we could read into this scripture is context that I don't believe is there is that, well, jo well, John's baptism called for repentance of sin, but John prepared people to for the one that would come later, right? As if, you know, you could, there, I don't know that a lot of people do this, but I'm just saying it could be taken like, well, John's baptism, you know, John bapt baptized with water for, the, for, for uh, the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. But Jesus comes and he baptized you. He's greater and he baptized you with fire. So I don't know if any of you view it this way. Um, but I would say this is, you know, categorically incorrect, you know, um, something I've been combating a lot in many different conversations is the approach to a passage or to a, to, to a phrase with an absolute view on that phrase or terminology, meaning you see it this way and that's the only thing that it could mean. So in here, it could absolutely mean this, but it could absolutely mean something different. It's very, very possible of both. It doesn't mean that, you know, John's baptism was this and no one does that anymore. We can actually look and see that that's, that's false because Peter, which is after Christ and after John, right? Christ has already come. His baptism was a baptism of repentance in water for remission of sins. So I think to take this as an absolute statement, like, well, that was for the, the just John's disciples baptized this way. Jesus' disciples didn't do that. They just received the spirit. They're just baptized with fire or whatever the terminology is, you know. So that's why I wouldn't subscribe to that, that view of passages like this. There's a few like that that we can take them a certain way. Um, but I think they still apply. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So John's baptism calls, calls for remission of sins. But John himself told the people to believe in one that will come later, Jesus. And they heard that they were baptized in his name. So you're accepting. It's not that the plan of salvation, it's not that water baptism or, or like is repentance out the window now? No, repentance is not out the window. Everyone still has to repent if you believe in the Messiah or not.
but John's baptism was awaiting the Messiah. This baptism is knowing that he already arrived. He was already glorified. His spirit has already been poured out and you now have access to that gift. Do you want to receive that? Do you want to be born again? Do you want to be a new creature? Do you want to bury the old man, wash away your sins, relieve yourself of that burden, of that, of that torment, of that guilt that you may, be, may, may have over the years of just knowing what the gospel teaches and that we're depraved without the spirit of God, without being born again, right? Our natural state is sin, is to be sinful. So do you, do you believe that he has come? Do you believe that he forgives you? Do you believe that he saves you? Do you believe in washing away your sins by calling upon the name of the Lord? It'd be different if I told you to take a bath, right? Just wash away your sins. Just jump in the pool, right? Or if I told you to take a bath and call on John Smith, I don't know. Um, I tell you to, to, I don't know. I'm trying, I'm thinking the names. I'm like, nah, don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say this. Um, LeBron James, take a bath and call on LeBron James and you'll be saved. You know, I'm not saying that. I'm telling you to have faith that, that God became man, right? God took on human form, walked the earth, died for your sins so that you would be free from them. So that you'd be free from the penalty of sin, but so that you could have new life while you're here. Do you want that? Right? So when you wash... Call on him. Call on the name of the Lord when you bury the old man in that pool. And once you bury the old man, then he can give you new spirit, right? And I would say in general, like in Acts, the second chapter, in general, that's what I would prescribe someone do if they believed and if they wanted that, right? Um, now we do see what's awesome is we do see that there is no order to how things can be done. So you can, you can sit here and say, you're going to tell me, you're going to tell me, look, I told you I'm not doing what about isms. You know what I mean? I'm not doing what about isms. Get off my heels for a second. <laughs> you're going to tell me, I love what people say. So what you're saying is, <laughs> so, so what you're trying to say? No, I'm not, I'm not trying to say anything. I mean, I'm just, I'm reading the text, right? But I know that what it can do, it can put you in a defensive position like, you know, I went to church all my life, or you can't tell me I don't have the Holy Spirit. I've seen God do this. I've seen, you know, whatever the case may be, all the things that you believe give credence to the fact that you are saved, that you're good with God. I'm not challenging that at all, because we see here that he poured out his spirit whenever he wanted on whoever was of a sincere heart. I have no problem with that, right? I have no problem with that. But after they did say, can any man forbid water? Can any man? Can anyone? For any reason, Right? Not what about isms? Well, what if what if they're handicapped and they have an allergy to to the to, to hydrogen that's in the water? I you know whatever we come up with. All right, I don't know what God's going to do for that guy. I have no idea, man. I'm going to try to get him in that pool. <laughs> that's what I'm going to try to do. But they, forget the what about isms, right? Sure, you received it, or sure they received it, but have they been buried in water, calling upon the name of the Lord to save them from the, their sins and to make them a new creature? If you haven't, that's what's written in here. That's what those men that said, call whoever calls, calls upon the name, this is what they did. Not just that phrase of one thing they said, but in application when they did it, this is what it looked like. Anyway, I don't, you know, sometimes when people are teaching something or sharing something, whatever it is, we end up dealing with the naysayer too much. You know, we make our whole thing about dealing with the people that don't like what we say. And I try not to do that. But in this case, I can see where other people say it differently or, or view it differently, interpret this differently, apply it differently and may have opposition. So I just wanted to want to address that, hopefully and reasonable. So we got water baptism. We have repentance, water baptism and the spirit, water and the spirit. OK. Paul. Now, now Paul's conversion was actually in the ninth chapter, right? So here he's retelling how that conversion went, and but he gives some details that I don't think are in the ninth chapter, right? So he, he re, retells, right, and adds a little bit more to the story than what we had the first time. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, for you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. This is what he was told, right? What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized, having your sins washed away. So if we have any doubt of what for the remission of sins means, I've debated this with pastors, um, but it means to wash away your sins, to remit like cancer being in remission. It's the forgiveness or really the removal, the erasing, the washing away of sins by doing what? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved from the condemnation of their sins because they wash it out, calling upon the blood of the lamb. I'm just, I'm adding, you see, I'm adding some things in there. <laughs> I hope it's contextual. Um, so this is just him recalling his own salvation. He called upon the name of the Lord. How, when, did he, when was he told to do it? When he was baptized, washing away his sins. Okay. So let's see. Um, was there water and was there spirit? It doesn't literally say, and then when he received the spirit, we're going to assume that Paul had the Holy Spirit because in this uh, Corinthians second chapter, he said he came demonstrating this power of the spirit and that no man could do all these things or, or, or uh, understand these things without the spirit. Um, we got water, we got spirit, right? Um, so remember, you know, Acts, the second chapter and Romans, the 10th chapter, right? This is where it all started was confession calling upon the name of the Lord. But where do we see them call upon the name of the Lord? It was through water baptism. It wasn't just a, the, the out loud proclamation of faith in front of the assembly or whatever. That's good. But that's not what they actually did. They didn't say, now you stand up in front of the audience. Like we have a crowd gather. We have witnesses here that can hear you say that you do believe this. They say, there goes water, right? Can any man forbid water? That was the eunuch that said, there's water. Can I, can I be saved? Sure. Do you believe? Right. It was the other way around. That was the, uh, did I, did I skip, I skipped that, didn't I? Hold on. Hold on. You slipped one by me. Y'all, you thought you were slick. You, you, you guys really thought you could do it. You really thought you were going to slip one by me right there. Okay. Let me say, nah, seriously, Keith, he was just unprepared. <laughs> so this was the, the eunuch, right? The story of the eunuch. And um, he's reading this scripture. I think I believe it was Isaiah. Yeah. And he reads this and, and Philip, right? He just walks up and he says, uh, um, do you understand what you read? Now, no, I ah, see. I don't want, I don't want to do it, man. Pastors use this to say that you can't understand the Bible without them. And I just got to put a pen. In. No, this was a guy that never even read this stuff. Wasn't saved. Didn't know anything. This wasn't a believer not knowing how to study and, and learn the scriptures. Okay. This is a man that never knew anything about this. And he's reading this and he says, uh, Philip walks up and says, uh, do you understand what you read? How can I, unless someone instruct me, unless someone explained this to me. So the eunuch asked Philip, Philip, you know, um, the, the, the sheep, you know, he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, right? He didn't open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Uh, who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch's question is, who is this prophet talking about? Is this himself or is this somebody else? So Philip explained to him from that, the gospel, right? So they rode along and they came to some water, not fire, <laughs> you know, cause I know there's different schools of thought that when, you know, in the, in the new Testament, you know, and after Christ, you know, after Christ had come the baptism of Jesus was just fire. Um, but it was it was water done in his name, which brought the fire. Um, they came to some water and he says, look, there's some water. Can I be baptized? Hmm. There goes water. So Philip didn't say, well, no, water was for John's disciples, right? I'm just looking at a different, different version. Yeah. 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 So that version, this is, this, hold on. Let's, let's go back. Let's go back. Hold on. And you're like, Keith, you say it doesn't, doesn't even matter what, what version we read from. You said that. Why'd you say that? I don't know why I said it. <laughs> I don't know. Because it's easy. Because it's easy to read. 
Uh, look, here's some water. Why can't I be baptized? And then it says he ordered the carriage to stop and it went down. So let's get like, like he didn't even answer him in that version. He never even answered him. So let's go down. Uh, here is water. What hinders me or what stops me from being baptized? And this one has an answer. And Philip said, if you believe with all thine heart, remember belief in the heart, right? And you may, you know, and he answered, said, I believe that Jesus Christ, oh, confession, we we have him. We have confessions made with the mouth, right? But I say jokingly, but in, in all sincerity, you know, he didn't say, no, 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 the water, you didn't misunderstood me. The water was just for John's baptism, awaiting the one that was to come. He didn't say that. He said, do you believe, right? So I'm trying to see. Um, sorry for the sidebar. I'm sorry. So our different Greek source source text, which is where the English come from. Um, I don't think this is like all of them necessarily, but you see they're different lengths. So some are much shorter, some are much longer. Um, which is why we don't have that passage in some of them. Okay. I'm not a big fan of these. I don't want to go on that because these are, they are the minority as far as what, what they agree with. And the, this is the majority text because the, the majority of this era of scripture all says the same thing. Um, for the most part, <laughs> put a pin in that. I digress. Um, so we got, we got what we needed there, right? Let's move on. Water and spirit. Um, so, all right, I've already spoken to kind of the, uh, what do you call it? Dichotomy or contrast or whatever we do that puts kind of Jesus's salvation, you know, or what we do once we believe in Jesus different than what John's disciples did. We have a, we have a separation between John and Jesus, right? So John and them did it this way. That was John's baptism. John baptized the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. Um, so, you know, if that's, if that's either your view or the view that you're, you have someone, you know, that you're talking to someone about, you're trying to, to consider or answer. So John's, John taught his disciples to repent, to turn, Identify your sin, turn from your ways, wash yourself to remove sin, to be pure for the Lord to come, to follow him. But we no longer have to do those things to follow him. <laughs> like that's, that's, I laugh. I just laugh, you know, to take it lightly, but you know, that's kind of what we're saying, you know? Um, so John started with water and his role was to prepare the way Christ just came and complete the process like you're washed and made a new vessel and now he can put a new spirit in that vessel right it's no good if there's no washing if there's no turning from your ways he can't give you new life like even even companies you know, i've read books on how new ceos take over companies and and, and how do they do that and the first thing a lot of times it's clean it's clean house you you got to get the old ways out the, the way the people that worked under the last CEO or whatever it was, they have a particular way of doing things and they're not apt to change. They don't see the reason for change. Well, that's why the new CEO was hired. It's time for change. So I got to get people that are malleable, people with fr that are fresh, that are open to fresh ideas, not, well, this is what we normally do. <laughs> you know, you're here in church. Well, this is, this is what we normally do. All right. So there's a little bit of that. I'm just secular example, but. It's not that, you know, one replaces the other. It's not that well, the, the baptism of fire now replaces the baptism of water, right? I'm sorry, my ankle is itching me. <laughs> so uh, let's see, we're, we're pretty well through. Man, we, we got a little bit, we got a little bit. We got, we got to go through um, the water and the spirit, right? We kept seeing water and spirit, water and spirit, water and spirit. And then so the dichotomy or the contrast between John and Jesus and water and spirit, water and spirit, right? So in John 1, we see that from the beginning, right? The, the divinity, which was in the beginning, took on flesh 
and walked amongst us, to, to paraphrase that first part. Before he did that, John was sent to prepare the way. He said that Christ would come, right? Whose shoes I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, worthy to even tie. He's going to baptize you with fire. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, right? He's going to give you new life. So John 1, let's get, let's get a passage here. John and 1 and 30. And hopefully, you know, you're in the comments and jotting down ideas or thoughts or taking notes, if you will, or asking me, wait a minute, you said this, I didn't, I don't understand. Um, he is the one I was talking about when I said a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water. So you might be revealed. So he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit. If anyone doesn't understand this, this is Malachi, the fourth chapter. Um, John the Baptist's ministry was that of Elijah, was the spirit of Elijah, fulfilling the prophecy of Malachi, the fourth chapter, that God would send a forerunner to prepare the way for the Lord before he comes. So John says, you know, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven. And resting upon him. I didn't know that he was the one, but God, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me the one whom you see the spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So I saw this happen to Jesus. So I testify that he is the chosen one of God, right? Well, let's jump ahead Oh, a little background. You know, John the Baptist preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented for their sins and turned to God for forgiveness. And he says, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So even the forerunner was preparing the way for two things, for two main components, water and spirit, water and spirit. John only had the water, but that is not to assume that once the spirit comes, you do away with the water because we've already seen when the rubber hit the road in Acts 2 two places in Acts 8, one place in Acts 10, and and uh, we're going to assume in Acts 22, uh, Acts 19, uh, we see that what was constant? Water, repentance, right? F repentance and water baptism for what? For the remission of sins or to be, to be forgiven. And then we be baptized with the Holy Spirit, right? So I think that's the foundation. That was the plan from the beginning. Um, so let's see, right? Uh, Nicodemus, very smart man, very experienced Jew, comes to Jesus by night and says, look, I don't understand what you're talking about, dude, but obviously with the things that you do, you're of God, but your, your message, I, I, I don't understand it, you know. Jesus answered, said unto him, verily, verily, which means truly, truly, or you're speaking emphatically. There's, there's no truer statement than what I'm about to say. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, except a man be born again. So I used to think that born again was some charismatic phrase, like meaning just some church folk, they act, like, they act that way and they're born again. And it, it was more charismatic. Um, and I read it, I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, oh so this is, this is something Jesus said we got to do. Oh, well, when was that? When, when was I born again? Right? So if you're not born again, you can't see the kingdom. So Nicodemus has a natural response. Well, well, how am I born again? I was born, right? So how can I be born when I'm old? Can I enter a second time into my mother's womb and be born? Jesus said again, emphatically, I say unto you, except a man is born of water, you already see it. I bumped it up for you. So we are without excuse. <laughs> You're born of water and of spirit. Now, do you think it's just a coincidence that we have two components for being born again? And in Acts 2 and in Acts 8. Two places. And in Acts 10. You gotta make the sound effect. And in Acts 19. And in Acts 22. <laughs> and in John talking about his plan. All these, we just have the same two components. But 
it is taught and or believed today that this phrase, right, that the way that they put Christ, not, not at odds with each other, but that Christ is now what we do. We don't do what John taught. We do what, you know, Jesus does. Well, Jesus did this. These, Jesus did the same thing John did. Jesus taught that. His men taught that. But what they'll say is like, well, you're born of water when you come through the birth canal. So now you need to be born of spirit, not just water, not just a fleshly birth, but you got to be born in the spirit. Got to be baptized with fire. So I just want to show you that's what some do with the scripture is what they think it means. But I've already shown you how all over, after people called upon the name of the Lord, the next components in their salvation was water and spirit, water and spirit. Have the water, not the spirit, need the spirit. Have the spirit, not the water, need the water. Can any man forbid it? No. There goes water. Can I? Sure. You know, this isn't something we do to show church membership. This isn't something we do. Um, it's an outward expression of an inward bull. <laughs> you know, it's not, a, it's not external showing anything. It's not a symbol of anything. It's what they were instructed to do to be saved. Call upon him. And when they call upon him, when they were submerged in water. Now, why? This will explain to us why. What happens there? Because you're like, well, you're telling me? You mean to tell me? So what you're trying to say, back off, okay? <laughs> back off. I have made no doctrine. I have established no plan of salvation for you and for those that are far off. This is his. Same mine. I'm not trying to do nothing with it. I'm just reading, and I'm zippering them together. That's all. I'm just making all of them count collectively because these are all the same people and same plan, like I said from the beginning. Jesus didn't teach something different. John didn't teach something different. Paul, Peter, Philip, they didn't teach different things. They had one teaching which came from the Father. Jesus, what he, what he said and what he did did not come from him. It came from the Father. Likewise, his apostles, they were sent as messengers to carry the same exact content that the Father gave him to give to us. It should all be the same. And it should all work together, you know. So this is not water birth. This is John's water. Except you be born of water, born again. Um, and I have an, obviously another scripture. See, see, see. The more the more you go through, there's just more scriptures come to mind. Um, the same. Uh, we're born again through the water and through the Spirit working together. Not not just John's. Not just praying for the Holy Spirit. Right. But both are needed. Why? Because you need new spirit. You need new life. You need to be born again. You need to be born again to enter the kingdom of God this time, to see it and to enter it. But you got to be washed. Can any man forbid water? Because Can anyone sit here and tell me today on this live stream that you don't need to be washed? I would venture to say most of y'all would admit you need continual washing. Right? But that's what, like when we say that, we say that we, we don't need to be washed. It's just an outward symbol. No, I need washing. Was it Elijah that told Naaman, um, the Sumerian king, I think it was, I can't remember, to, to wash me in the Jordan seven times? And he's like, are you serious? Just just go in water. It'll wash away. And look, look, if I told you to do some crazy thing, you wouldn't believe me. Or if, no, you want me to tell you to do some crazy thing. I'm, I'm you get what I'm trying to do, right? I'm I'm somewhere in the, the the building, you know. Get off my heels. I'm somewhere <laughs> there. But you need to wash away your sins, and then you think it's silly for me to think that baptism washes away sin. Well, we don't need that. It's just a symbol, you know. Well, you're, well, you're acknowledging that it would work as a symbol, like it logically makes sense that this would go with that. Um. But I'm saying it's taught, it, it's how they taught you to bury the old man. Jesus was buried in the tomb. You bury him in water, calling upon the name of the Lord, wanting him to raise you from the dead. Ephesians, the second chapter, said we were dead in our sins, and he quickened us, made us alive through the Spirit. We want to be raised in newness of life, as Romans, the sixth chapter, says. We were buried with him through baptism. And just like he was raised from the dead, we can be raised with newness of life. So we shouldn't be slave to sin anymore. We shouldn't obey and be the servant of sin because we're free, right? So this is, you have to be born again to, to, to see the kingdom of God 
And he, he clarifies of water and of spirit. You need both components. What John started off with and what I put the bow on to enter the kingdom of God. And this is simple. That which is born of flesh is flesh. You're a fleshy human being. So that's what you are. But that which is born of the spirit, that spirit, that's not the same thing, right? So don't be surprised when I tell you, you must be born again, because you know you're carnal. You know you're earthly, which means you're, you're carnal, which means two things. Your earthly body is going to die. No one needs to tell you that. We all know it. So your body is aging, waxes old, is ready to decay and to die and vanish from the earth. So you will perish. But also you have sin. So you should have to perish and pay the penalty for those sins. You follow the lust of the flesh being carnal being flesh right so it's multiple it, it's I, I don't know if jesus had one intent i can't tell you that but you're born of flesh and this is what flesh entails but being born of spirit so don't be surprised when i tell you you got to be born again and the wind blows you may not understand it right and that's what that's how it's like when you're born of the spirit you don't necessarily understand it right but you don't need to you see the signs of it like when the wind blowing leaves around you don't know where it comes from or where it goes but you see the signs of it same with those that are born of the spirit Okay. So ironically, right. Or, or fulfilling a pattern, not ironically, but I think there's a pattern that God said for anything to be established as, as true. Excuse me. You need two things. Oh, you need, you need, you need something. You need two or three witnesses. This is old Testament and new Testament. You need two witnesses two or three, to be something be established as fact. So do you think it's a coincidence that for his plan of salvation, he has two witnesses, John and Jesus, right? And those witnesses have two components, the water and the spirit. Not one component, right? But two. And let's see if I can get a little something extra for you. The other ones I didn't stop to get, I will stop to get this one. Um, the other one's being Ephesians, the second chapter, and Romans, the sixth chapter I mentioned uh, a few seconds ago. Um, I, I recited them, but hopefully you can go get them. Uh, so now, it's kind of a controversial passage. Um, just going to highlight the whole thing for us. Bear with me, and boom. We got... There we go. First John, fifth chapter. Two or three witnesses, right? So John says, who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the son of God. This is that which came by water and blood. Water and blood now. He didn't say it came by water and spirit, but hold on, water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but water and blood. And this is the spirit which bears witness, right? Because this is the spirit of truth. So he came by water and blood and the spirit bears witness that this is true. But there's three that bear record in heaven, the father, the word, and the Holy ghost. And these three are one. And there's three that bear witness, uh, that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree or exist as one. So these th things coincide as one unit. Um, they agree as one, the spirit, the water, and the blood. So then we have three witnesses collectively, collectively testifying to one thing. So you could tell me when you got the spirit, right? If we're, if we're, if we're again, you know, just trying to answer the need for all the components that the apostles taught and not saying, well, it's just the baptism of fire. It's not the water baptism. Any, just to show you the importance, right? You can be the, the spirit of God can pour out on you. You can speak in tongues. You can prophesy. I don't care if you raise the dead. Well, okay, you got the spirit, right? Well, when did you get the blood? Well, that was Jesus, right? You got that covered. That's an easy one. I believe in the I believe in him, right? I believe in his blood. But when did you get the water? Can any man forbid water? Like it's it's, it's real simple, right? I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. 
but it's real simple. It's there. It's there no matter where you look, right? Let's go back before we're done. Why Jew and Gentile? There is no difference between Jew or Greek. It's all the same Lord. Whosoever, Jew or Greek. You say, well, I hear you, but I want it from another place. Okay. See, I, I, I hear your thoughts. And this is a crucial, this is a crucial passage. And it, for multiple reasons, you can go here for multiple reasons. Galatians, the third chapter. Purpose of the law. And we're sons through faith. You are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Doesn't matter if you're bond or free, male or female. You're all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and inheritors of the promise. Okay? That's another, you know, another conversation is this part. But what this is pertaining to is the same thing that this is pertaining to. Being saved. Jew and Greek, same Lord, rich in mercy, right? Whoever calls upon his name. Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or free, female, he is faithful and just to forgive you. He, can, he will be your savior no matter what nation you're from no matter what gender you are, no matter anything. And now we have more genders. I don't care if you're transgender. I don't care what other add to it. He's Lord of all. If you got breath in your lungs, he doesn't discriminate. Flesh is flesh. It's important to understand because people teach there's different plans of salvation, whether you're Jew or Gentile. And it's incorrect for reasons we saw here. Like I, I went and showed you th these passages, Romans 10 and Galatians 3, to show you that. Okay. But to go back, we're, he's talking about, you know, he's talking to a Jew and telling him, you need water and you need spirit. But more importantly, if you're born of the flesh, that's all you are is flesh. Don't be surprised if I tell you you must be born again. So a Jew must be born of water and spirit. A Jew has to be born again because they're only born with flesh. 1 Corinthians 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither can corruption inherit incorruption. And he said, behold, I'll show you a mystery. You shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, right? And he talks about being changed to immortality, right? Because this fleshy existence can't go where God is taking us. Can't go where we need to go. It is not it. You're born into this world. You're flesh. You exist. Cool. But through the power of the gospel in Jesus Christ, we can be like him. That's a, that's a conversation for another day, is when we'll be like him. Um, and the ultimate, you know, transformation, the ultimate, and I'm not talking about some uh, uh, Mormon, uh, uh, what do they call it, man, you become a God and get your own plan, and I'm not, nothing mysterious like that, you know, um, just celestial, just being changed to be in the same form as him, heavenly. So. Flesh and blood can't see, can't enter, and can't see. First, first Corinthians that I just gave says you can't enter the kingdom unless you're born again, right? Paul's saying what Jesus just said. You can't enter the kingdom unless you're born again. And in the second chapter, he says you can't see the kingdom. If you're not born again, <laughs> you know what I mean? So in the in second, uh, first Corinthians, second chapter. 
Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of the man the things that God has prepared for them that he loves. Put that on a plaque. But God has revealed them. Oh, hold on. Eye has not seen. Oh, ear has not heard. But God revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So hold on. The spirit searches and reveals things of God, the things of God, okay? For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man. You know things of a man because you got the spirit of a man in you. So you think like a man, you know the things of this world, the things of the flesh. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us. Oh, the things revealed. Which things also we speak not in, in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. But that which is born of flesh is flesh. They cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto them. Neither can they know them. They cannot know them. To see my estimation, my take, right? We're not talking about looking at the pearly gates and seeing St. Peter ready to open the gates. Give your robe and your wings and your halo, okay? That's not seeing the kingdom of God. To know, to perceive, to see it. Yep. Without being born again. You are just flesh, and you can't receive the things of the Spirit. You cannot know them. They're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yea, yet himself he is judged of no man. Who knows the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Well, why do we have the mind of Christ? Because we have the Spirit of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit, which is called the Spirit of Christ, or the mind of Christ. He will let us see the kingdom of God. He will let us perceive, to understand the deep things of God, which he revealed to us by his spirit, right? You, you see, am I, am I off base, guys? Am I off base? Let me know. Um, so it's, it's, the necessity is for all men to be born new, to be made new creatures, right? Marvel not that I say, you must be born again. Flesh is flesh, right? So, you know, we're children of Adam. We're born in his likeness and his image, and we're destined for corruption. We're going to decay, like I said. So we need to be born in the image of the second Adam or the last Adam. The first Adam was a living soul. So yes, you're a living person. You're a living soul. The last Adam was a quickening spirit. That's the same word in Ephesians, the second chapter, after it talked about us being dead in sin and being quickened or made alive through the spirit. Okay. So the, the spiritual didn't come first, but the natural afterwards, the spiritual. So the first man is earthly. The first man that God made, the first Adam was just earthly. Boom. That's it. And you're born like him, and you got the mind like him, and you understand the things that he has, and you're going to die like him, and you're going to fall short like him, and you're like him. But the second man is the Lord from heaven. Are you like him? When were you born again in his likeness? When were you made like him? When were you given his spirit, not the spirit of a man, but the spirit of the Lord from heaven? So he says, as is the earthly, such are they which are earthly. As is the heavenly, such are they. So if you're earthly, you act earthly. If you're heavenly, you act heavenly. You're like them. And as we have borne the image of earthly, so shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We must be born again. Jew, Gentile, no matter who, anyone born of Adam <laughs> has to be born again. And how do he say that was? Of water and of spirit. When the rubber hit the road, how did they do it? Same as John, but in the name, 
calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus. They still repented. They still washed. But they washed calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God whose blood takes away the sins of the world. And then they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, water and spirit. Now they are a new creature, right? Now they're given new life. They're buried with him and resurrected to new life. It's like the parable of the new wineskins and the new wine or new spirits, wine and spirits, right? You don't put new wine in old wineskins or it bursts and it uh, breaks. Oh, you need new skin. You need a new vessel. It's got to be washed. Do you know that before they take that animal skin and put wine in it, they submerge it in water? You have to be washed. You have to be purged like Noah. Peter says that baptism is the like figure or, or uh, Noah and the flood is the like figure to, to baptism. You know, eight souls were saved by water through the flood. And the, the same likeness for us with water baptism. It's the same as, as Israel, right? Coming through the water to salvation. It's all there. It all takes belief. It all takes hearing and knowing who the true living God is, who the Messiah is, who the Son of God is, and that he really did come and he really did manifest uh, who he was. He really did die. He really was crucified at no fault of his own. He really was raised and he really does reign at the right hand of the Father from heaven today. And he really does change men's lives. And he really does pour out his spirit. So there's more. There's so many things. Like I say, a lot, a lot of things come to mind in this conversation. I'm going to wrap up for now. A lot of things come to mind. Um, what about this? What about that? What about the thief on the cross, right? Um, the, that would be the exception, not the rule. What I just mapped out was the rules. What they told every man to do. That doesn't mean the thief isn't saved because he didn't do this. That means that God is just as merciful as we believe he is, that even though that man couldn't do that, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what we do with the thief. It really doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with all of this other stuff. So try to steer clear of what about isms. Don't ask of them. Don't, don't think that way. And don't, uh, don't acknowledge them because that's all they are. They're just, they're, they're impossible hurdles to jump that lead nowhere. So I mentioned Ephesians, the second chapter, um, so a lot more can be said about being saved by grace through faith, not of works. Baptism is a work. Well, tell these men, tell Jesus. Um, the one thing I missed, you know, going through the Jesus and John relationship, I don't think I touched on is right after, you know, um, so, you know, I, I don't know. John baptizes. We're waiting on him. Him shows up. The spirit descends like a dove, right? John and Jesus go out baptizing. Jesus sends his men. Jesus' men, after his death and after the spirit pours out, go out baptizing. You know what I mean? Like, like it never changed. Jesus baptized. Paul baptized. He said, I'm glad I didn't baptize none of you because of this preferential treatment that you have over the one that baptized you. But, you know, it's crazy you hear preachers say, well, he said, I'm glad I didn't baptize you. No, 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 he didn't say I didn't baptize you. He said, I didn't baptize you, not that you weren't baptized. You see, we're making scripture say things they're not saying. And it's, and again, that's why I said from the beginning, I'll, all I ask is you be genuine. All I ask. If you're, if you're not genuine, we're going to fall into things like that. We're going to fall into that, that, um, that old way of thinking, this is how I view it. And we're going to hold on to that and not hear what's being laid out. So um, there's several parts of this conversation we'll save for another day. Um, why baptism is not a work or, or, or repentance isn't a work. Faith isn't a work. Um, yeah. So um, let me know, guys. Uh, you know, Hopefully you did so in the chat. If you're replaying this, you know, in the comments, let me know. Um, Definitely participate, join in the chat, or if you want to do a stream 
and do a spinoff and talk about certain points. I've laid out my case. If you want to talk about certain points, I don't mind if you do that. If you want to hear what I got to say about it, we can do that. If you just want to make your case, you know, um, hit me up. Um, but again, I'm thinking of moving to Tuesday or Wednesday around noontime. Okay. Summertime, summer, summer, summertime, right? It's fun time. Um, so anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope this helped in some way. I'm out. I'm almost out. Hold on. Cue the music. <laughs>